Full spring food. I think that says that in your bulletin. Uh, so make sure you do that. Uh, so you don't have to worry about like, oh, if we come here, of course, if you don't know, but uh, it's going to be right out there. So that's going to be July 2nd, Independence Day weekend. It's going to be a whole lot of fun. Awesome. At this point, I'm trying to take a second, stand up, greet each other, greet a father that you maybe know or don't know. Tell them Happy Father's Day.
It's this song. Now, this is the first time we've done this here. This song is all about honor. And we're going to be talking about and listening to some words about honor this morning. As we think about Father's Day, and honoring our fathers, and ultimately what it means to be a person who's worthy of honor. As we think about all that, let's think about our Heavenly Father who is worthy of all honor and all praise. So like I said, this is a bit of a new song, so just start singing along as soon as you catch on to it. For the honor of the Father who reaches out to us, that we might live inside His love, He gave His only Son. For the honor of the Savior, that the cross be lifted high, the great exchange of love and grace came down to give us life. Forever. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're like, ah! Well, good morning. My name is Brian Johnson. For those that don't know me, I have the privilege of being the director of men's ministry here at Frontline. And I'll be up here again to talk about Honor Takes Courage. Uh, if you've been with us, attending for a while, you know that we've been doing a set of challenges for our guys. A set of challenges that we call Honor Takes Courage. I uh, range from everything from uh, watching the Courageous movie to doing some really hands-on challenges, uh, things like a uh, specific Mother's Day challenge, writing letters to your kids, dating your kids, um, those types of things. And then it, it wrapped up really last night with what we call the ultimate challenge, which was taking part in a resolution ceremony. It was a, it was a really neat night. Um, and we had guys from multiple churches come together to do this. Uh, we had together for a dinner over at Kentwood Community Church and uh, heard a, a good little message. And then we got to, as men, stand up and publicly state what we want to be about going forward, which is to be you know, guys who are courageous, guys who are living and loving and leading their families. And it was a powerful night, so I just want to give a shout out to the five guys who, who did that. That was super cool, much respect to you. Um, so, all these, yeah, we'll get to this in a moment, okay? In case you're wondering. So, I, as we talk about these challenges, what I want to do, since it's Father's Day, it seems like a good day to honor guys, right? So, if you participated in any of the challenges, whether it was a courageous movie, any of the different hands on challenges or the ultimate challenge, can I get you to stand right now? Just stand up right where you're at if you took part in the challenges. Come on, you can do it. There we go. So can we just honor these guys? Isn't that cool just to see so many guys taking part in challenges? And uh, just to give you an idea, we had guys filling out completion forms when they did them. And, and so you can see there's a lot of completion forms here. And uh, what we're going to do, another way that, that we honor guys, I'm going to shuffle these up, hopefully, without dropping them. And uh, we're going to have someone pick one. So, and then we have a little prize form. So let me do this. All right, so would you do the honors for me? Pick out a card, any card. It's not a card trick. And uh, we have Lynn Thomas. Oh, That's the winner. Thank you. 
strange things that I say. Uh, so, what does honor really mean? And what does it look like? So the honor, or the Bible says some things about honor, right? Probably some famous things. So let's do a little test this morning. We'll see if you've been reading your Bible lately. So I'll, I'll start and I'll let you finish, okay? Honor your father and mother. Father and mother. Very good. See? You guys are paying attention. That's awesome. Yeah, five times the Bible tells us that. To honor your father and mother. It also says things like, the Apostle Peter says, honor the king. The Apostle Paul says things like, to one of his, uh, his, uh, his guys that was helping him, he says, honor men like him. So the question is, is honor just something that, you know, is for those knights and damsels in distress? Is honor something? How do we apply this idea of honor from the Bible today? And I think it's something that we have to really wrestle with. Because it's easy to honor someone, like for example, the guys, the firefighters that ran at 9-11 into the Twin Towers to rescue people. It's easy to honor them, isn't it? It's sort of obvious. It's like, yes, they did something heroic and brave and courageous, and it's easy to honor them. But what do we do when it says, honor your father and mother, mother, and maybe it's hard to do that. Maybe Mother's Day was really difficult for you this year because you found it hard to honor your mother based on your upbringing or based on some of your past experiences. What do we do with things like that? Because you see, you're, yeah, obviously last week I gave away talk to guys, but honor isn't something just for guys, it's something that impacts men and women. And, but it's something that takes courage. And so what is courage? Now I know last week we spoke specifically to men, and we, you know, we talked about being alert, being the sentry, standing firm in the faith, by being the shield, and loving strong. So this week as we're speaking to men and women, I want to give you more of just a, a general definition of what is courage. Because honor, you know, think of the firefighter running into the Twin Towers. Honor definitely takes courage. So here's a definition for it. Courage is standing firm or continuing on in the face of difficulty or danger. Let me say that again. Courage is standing firm or continuing on in the face of difficulty or danger. So what does that mean about courage? It usually comes when you're doing something difficult or something hard. Right? Which is why... When we start thinking about honor, what we really want to communicate is that real life honor, real life honor takes courage. Now, if you're here last week, maybe you're asking yourself the question, are they hung up on this real life idea, right? Last week was real life courage, this week they're saying real life honor. Aren't you guys being a bit redundant? Yes, and on purpose. Because when we talk about these ideas of courage, we talk about ideas like honor. We think these are, they're these great, noble things, but we struggle at times to apply them down into our own lives, right? We struggle to say, what does that really mean to me? What does that really look like to my life? And so we want you to know that when we talk about courage, we talk about honor today, we're really talking about our real lives. We're talking about the nitty gritty of the lives that we live. And so as we flesh this out today, as we explore this idea of honor, I want you to keep in mind that we're talking about real life honor. So think with me again, okay? So if we're not in the realm of damsels in distress and knights in shining armor, but we're in our real lives, how do we do things like honoring our mother and father? How do we do things like honoring our boss or honoring the king, honoring maybe people that are hard to honor? And it's, it's good questions to wrestle with, right? And it's great questions to ask. And it's easy to ask the questions. But today, guess what? I'm going to use my phone for an option. And I'm going to bring up a man of honor, our lead pastor. A man I'm proud to call my friend, Pastor John, to answer some of these questions. So, pastor John, come and tell us about honor. Thanks, Brian. Um, real life honor, as we've talked about it. I want to give you a picture of what honor is, okay? Uh, the word honor, it means a valuing, okay? That's really what it is. It means I value this. I, this thing has value to me. And so if you think back to, okay, let's go back to ASO. I know we pick on ASO a lot, probably. Uh, it's, it's okay, you know, we pick on ASO. But the thinking with ASO is oftentimes is at the end of the game, at the end of the season, everybody gets a trophy, right? Everybody gets a ribbon. 
Oftentimes, and the reason why they do that is because they don't want a kid to feel not valued. They don't want to have a kid feel that he wasn't being honored. Unfortunately, what oftentimes happens is it cheapens the honor to those who really excelled and did well. And so when everybody gets the trophy, when everybody's the winner, when everybody feels this, unfortunately, a lot of kids really don't even feel it. And so on a day like Father's Day, when it comes to this day, we say, okay, we're honoring fathers. Well, what about those fathers who really aren't that good? What about the fathers who really didn't show up to their kids? When we celebrate fathers in general, so often we look at this and we say, we want to honor, but we want people to really feel they value, they have value to us. And so, so here's the thing, I'll ask you a question. Can you value someone by your actions, but not really mean it? Can you value someone by your actions and not really mean it? Uh, sure, I value my parents, but I didn't always feel it. I value the president, but I may not always feel it. And so the question is, can you value someone by your actions but not really mean it? Is that kind of honor really honor? When we talk about this, real life honor takes courage. It takes courage to do that. Those who are courageous and those who actually live this way, we want to make sure they feel it. But the Bible is pretty clear. Honor your father and your mother. The Bible is clear. Honor the king or honor the president. Honor those in authority over you. Honor these people. Honor those people. Honor one another above yourselves. So how in the world do we do this? Well, the first thing is this. Real life honor is both internal and external. Real life honor is both internal and external. I want you to turn in your Bibles, please, to Mark. Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7 and verse 6. Mark chapter 7 and verse 6. If you're visiting with us today, we're so glad you're here. Um, and uh, one of the things that we do here from the Bible Church is we actually use this thing called the Bible. And it's, it's, uh, it's really our authority. It's, I, mean, I can have my own opinions, and as great as they are, they're still just my opinions. Uh, whereas what we have here is we have the written word of God. And so we want to see what does God have to say about this, not just what John has to say. So Mark chapter 7 and verse 6. The Pharisees were a group of people, and they were the, like the religious experts at the time. And the Pharisees, they didn't just know it, they were meticulous about living every little thing of the law out. If God said do this, they did it. If God said do that, they did it. If God said don't do that, they didn't do it. The problem was, so much of what they did was on the external. Oh, they kept every single command, just like God said. The problem was, they didn't do it from the heart. They didn't do it from inside of them. They did it just by the letter of the law. And so Jesus comes after them. Because they were trying to trick him. And so he comes after him and he says, he replied, Isaiah, the prophet back in the Old Testament, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people, here's our word, honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. And so he, say, he says, your honor that you're giving me is not internal. Your honor that you're giving me is simply external. And he says, your hearts, the inside, are far from me. And he uses a word when he says, this is the problem. And he uses the word hypocrite. Hypocrites. Have you ever been called a hypocrite? You ever been called that? You ever called maybe somebody else that? What is the idea of a hypocrite? Somebody who says one thing and does another, right? Somebody who's not real. The word hypocrite goes back to, all the way back to the, to the Greek and the Roman times, when they would have a person who was known as a hypocrite. You know what we call them nowadays? Actors. That's what we call them, okay? It's an actor. When you go and you turn on the TV and you're watching somebody in a non-reality show, okay, and you're watching somebody play a role, they're a hypocrite. 
And the thinking is, and see, we know this. We turn a movie on or we turn a TV on, and we're watching them, and we see them playing the role, and we realize that's not really them, and I know that. And so the person would get up on the stage back in Roman times, Greek times, they would get up on the stage, and they would put on a fancy mask, and then they would pretend to play this part, and everybody knew, oh, that's an hypocrite. Well, Jesus comes along, and, and it was also known as kind of a negative term here, because what he's saying to the religious leaders is he's saying, religious leaders, here's the problem. You are pretending to be this person on the outside, but I know full well you are not that on the inside. And so this idea that here they are coming along, oh God, we honor you, we give you value, we say you're more important than I am. But it says it's purely with their lips. And so what I want us to understand is that giving honor, if I give honor to my father or give honor to my mother, which is what I'm commanded to do, if I give honor to the king, we call him the president, our former president or current president, whatever it is, if we honor the authorities above us, if we honor these people, I have to ask myself, am I giving them honor simply because, oh yes, Mr. President, I'm so honored that you're my president, but I can't stand you and I have no respect for you. Oh, Mr. Authority, Mr. Police Officer over there. Yeah, I, I, I give you honor and respect because of your office, but I hate you. Oh, Father, Mother, knowing that our children would never hate us as parents, right? You know, as children, oh yes, I honor you, I will do that for you, but I can't stand your guts right now. It's that feeling. Honor, if I give somebody honor, it is supposed to be internal and external. But as we go on, there's another verse. And I believe it's up there, Romans 12.10. I want you to turn to Romans 12.10, please. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. If you're uh, there, go right a couple books. Romans chapter 12 and verse 10. You can even look at verse 9 there, Romans 12.9. Love must be sincere. That, uh, that word sincere is really, it means without a crack. It, it, the idea was that they would take a jar, a uh, clay pot, and then it would, if it got a crack in it, oftentimes you'd go to the market and they would take wax and they would fill in all around the jar so that it, protect, it, it made the crack not be evident and then they would paint it. The problem is, once you would go and try to put water in it or something that had weight, what would happen? It would crack. And so that jar was not sincere. It was, it was really cracked. And so the picture that Paul is saying to us is, he says, if we're going to love people, which remember the two greatest commandments, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, if we're going to be people of love, it must be sincere, without cracks, genuine. But then he goes on, hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love, and then here's our word, honor. Value one another above yourselves. Honor one another above yourselves. The Bible is clear. Honor those to whom God says give honor. This is where I go back. There's my opinions and then there's the Bible's opinions. I would love to go back and add some words and things to the Bible. I would, go, I would love to go in and add, oftentimes, as long as... How many of you would love to read some commands like that? You know? Do this. Then the John Lauder translation. As long as they're doing that, right? Remember, that's oftentimes the way we play this whole thing, whether it's in marriage, whether it's in parenting, whether it's in work. I will submit to you. Oh, because the Bible says submit to you, as long as you're worthy of being submitted to. Because I added the translation, as long as. But when the Bible comes along and says, honor one another above yourselves, I didn't see anywhere where it says, as long as. Honor your father and mother, as long as they're good parents. See, the problem is, is that the Bible doesn't give exceptions. It just says, do this. So how do we do this? Here's what I want you to see next. Giving honor can be a challenge. We've been talking about, over the last few weeks, doing these challenges, right? The challenge, go watch the Kratos movie. The challenge, don't just hand your wife a, a, a card on Mother's Day with your name on it. Actually write a little note to her. In fact, give her a card, okay? And that's passed already, probably yeah, beside the fact now. 
But when it comes to writing letters to your kids, do it. Now, those are challenges. It requires more of us. And so what we're saying here is giving honor can be a challenge. I want to focus on this idea of giving. The idea of giving, another way of saying it, is a gift. A gift. Did you know that honor can be a gift that you give to somebody? My question is, who needs to be given that gift in your life today? But I want you to go back through. We've already read some of these, and I'm not going to have you turn to these passages. But in Romans 12.10, it says, Be devoted to one another in brotherly brother love. Honor one another above yourselves. Now, here's the deal. Whenever it says the word one another, in, in, especially in Paul's epistles, Romans through Philemon, every time the, word, the phrase one another appears, it refers to other believers in Jesus Christ, other Christians. So that means when the body comes together, when you're speaking about another brother in Christ or another sister in Christ, it says, value them above yourself. Now you probably can look around the room, just take a quick scan around the room. You can probably think, you know what, I will gladly value them above myself because those are cool people. And then maybe you look around the room and you go, and I don't know if I can value them above me. I just don't know if I can. And then you value, and then you look at some and you say, there is no way. I can value them above me. And yet the Bible is clear. Do it. Honor one another. How do we do that? Honor your father and your mother. I can say without reservation, I had fantastic parents. Did I have perfect parents, Amy? No way. That's my sister, by the way. I did not have perfect parents. Amy did not. We did not have perfect parents. And there were times when my parents did it wrong. I have great parents, but there were times when they did it wrong. And yet, when they did it wrong, did my rules change? It didn't. If you're a parent in here and you know what it's like, you know what it's like because sometimes it's the best thing ever to get to be a dad or to get to be a mom. And yet there are other times when it's so daunting because you realize the gravity that your kids are watching literally everything that you do. Everything. And when you stop and you think, how have I messed them up? <laughs> or how have I done it right? Boy, giving honor can be a challenge to someone. Sure, when your parents did it right and they bought you the latest gadget or, you know, they told you you were awesome and they showed up at all your games or whatever. When the parents do it right, giving them honor back, God, I'm, right, parents, I'm so glad you're my dad. I'm so glad you're my mom. That, that's easy. But when your parents grounded you for the fourth time, and they removed all electronics for the next three years or whatever else. And at those moments, you're storming off into your room because you can't stand them at the moment. At that moment, do you say, Mom and Dad, I honor you right now. No, what are you doing? Fuming, waiting till you get to be a parent. And you're never going to do this to your kids, right? Yeah, right. Honor your father and your mother. 1 Peter 2.17, show proper respect to everyone. Love the brotherhood of believers. Here's this, fear God, honor the king. Now I need you to realize something. This is Peter, okay, Peter wrote this, 1 Peter 2.17. Peter is writing this about Caesar, okay? By about the time that Peter's writing this book, there's a guy by the name of Nero. You know who Nero is? Yes. Emperor Caesar Nero. What is Caesar Nero known for? Lighting Christians on fire. Okay? Nero was a horrible king. I mean, we've had bad presidents, but he's a horrible king. He was a despot. That's what he was. And yet, Peter is writing to his readers, and he's saying, guys, here's the deal. God put that authority in place. We don't get to say, I honor you as long as. Therefore, honoring the king may look like a gift that I'm giving. The last one. Romans 13, 6 and 7. I want you, you're, you're right near there, Romans 12. I want you to turn this to Romans 13, verse 6. Romans 13, verse 6. 
Romans 13, 1 through 7 is all about the authorities. It's all about people who are in authority over you. So we can put in their governors and mayors and police officers and whoever else, principals or, you know, whatever the situation may be. But I want you to see here verse 6, because it's talking about an issue that no Christian, but nobody really likes, and that is the issue of taxes. Verse 6, this is also why you pay taxes. Why? Because they're authorities, they demand it, therefore you submit to it. This is why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give everyone what you, and here's the word, owe him. If you owe taxes, pay your taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. If you owe someone honor, give them the gift of honor. But I recognize giving honor to somebody who we at that moment determine is not very valuable is hard to do. And therefore, at that moment, we have to say, am I simply going to give them a gift? For those of you children who are here who may be struggling here with your parents, I want you to pay attention. Because when it comes to honoring your parents, they're not always going to get it right. But maybe you need to say, here's a gift. When it comes to your principal or your teacher and you can't stand them at the moment, maybe you need to think to yourself, I'm going to give them a gift of value. I'm going to give them a gift of honor. To those teenagers, later teenagers, when it comes to the police officers pulling you over for going too fast, okay? Never happened to me, thankfully. Just kidding. When the police officer pulls you over, at that moment, what do you do? Am I going to give them value and am I going to honor them or am I going to try to get out of something? What is it? It's thinking to ourselves, if somebody is an authority, how can I give them the gift of honor? And so I want to give you a couple things. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Proverbs 26, verse 8, because I can hear it now. Pastor, this is all well and good, but you have no idea the kind of parents that my parents were. You're telling me I'm supposed to honor them? How? You have no idea. I have zero respect for this president. Oftentimes, I know, I hear a lot about it. People, they, we, we live in a country that's so divided politically, and maybe you couldn't stand the last president, now you're happy we got this one. Maybe you couldn't, you love the last president, now you can't stand this one. I don't care what camp you're in. The Bible is pretty clear. Honor the king, honor the president. And so, here's the thing, though, that we oftentimes think. If I give you value, and I give this gift of value and honor to you, it seems like I'm doing something bad. And so in Proverbs 26, verse 8, this is what it says. Like tying a stone in a sling is the giving of honor to a fool. Like tying a stone in a sling is the giving of honor to a fool. Okay? Now the Bible, it talks about the fool. The fool is somebody who doesn't care oftentimes what they're doing. They, they are very selfish, this person is. They want what they want and they don't care. Sounds like some people in this world that I know, doesn't it? And so the Bible says, the Bible counterbalances fools and wise people. And so we oftentimes look to ourselves and we say, we believe X person's a fool. So the Bible's pretty clear, like tying a stone in a sling is giving of honor to a fool. What does it mean to tie a stone in a sling? Okay, picture David and Goliath. Remember, he took his little sling and he had five stones. And then he takes this thing and he spins it around and then he slings the stone really fast so that it goes straight at his target and kills the animal or kills Goliath or whatever it is. Can you just picture David taking his little sling out, putting a stone in there, getting some string, tying it in there, and then going out to battle? And he's swinging this thing. He's like, where did the thing even? It's still in there. The point of putting it in is to not tie it so that it flies out. What the Bible says is when you give honor to a fool, it's like doing that. It's dumb. So we say, my parents aren't deserving of honor, therefore I shouldn't do it. The president is not deserving of honor. These authorities are not deserving of honor. I shouldn't do it. And yet when you get to the New Testament, it says do it anyway. So how do we do it? Well, I want to give you some practical ways to honor what I call the dishonor. We're going to go quick through this, so hopefully if you're writing it down, you can check it out real quick. These are from Ephesians 4, 29 to 32. So if you want to turn there, please. Ephesians 4, 29 to 32. 
You were in Romans before, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians. Ephesians 4, 29 to 32. And I just want to read this real quick. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. Practical ways to honor the dishonorable. First one, refrain from speaking negatively about them. And I hope they're not all capitalized, that's okay. The word them, I want you to focus on this. Refrain from speaking negatively about them. I'm not saying you have to agree with all their actions because some of you have gone through some pretty horrific stuff. I'm not saying you have to be, oh, I'm so excited I was abused. Oh, I'm so excited my dad abandoned me. I'm so excited. But we can refrain from speaking negatively about them. You see, one way that maybe you can honor your father or your mother today is on, on Father's Day, when you talk to your kids or talk to whoever about them, speak positive things. Or at the very least, don't come down on them and speak negatively about them as a person. Here's another one, which goes back to don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what's helpful for building others up. The second one, establish healthy boundaries with the right motives. I like this. Healthy boundaries are important. Some of you parents or authorities or whatever else, they crash in over your boundaries. It's our responsibility to set boundaries, okay? We have to sometimes set up I know parents, I, I know people whose parents live on the other side of the country and they do that for a reason. They don't live by them because the parents weren't good people. And yet the question then becomes, how do I have contact with them? How can I honor them? Oftentimes it's, it's I'm saying I'm going to have a relationship but these are the boundaries. I will not cross this. And then we have to ask ourselves for the motive question. Are the boundaries that I've set up protections for maintaining a God-honoring relationship, i.e., I have this boundary in place so that I can have an honorable relationship, or is my boundary that I set up a punishment for not being God-honoring? There has been parents who have blown it and they've done stupid stuff, and yet I've seen people who have said, I will never, ever let you see your grandkids. Maybe you've heard about that. It's almost like this, it's become, the kids become a tool, it's a punishment tool. And so my question to you is, the boundaries you set up, are they punishments or are they protections? That's a question. A third one. Show gratitude for the things they did right. Now for some of you, you might have to think long and hard for the one or two things they did right. But maybe that's what you focus on. I'm gonna show gratitude because, you know what, even though my dad was never there, he at least provided for the family. I'm, gonna, I'm thankful that I had a roof over my head. I had clothes on my back. I'm thankful for that. We can still show gratitude for the things they did right. Number four, have compassion for what may have caused or actually be causing their falls. We had a, a, a situation last night. We, were, we went to this, um, um, the manhood ceremony, the resolution ceremony. Here we are last night, and we're sitting in this room, and people are trying to talk. It was a gymnasium. It was hard enough to hear anyway. And you had one family right in front of our table, and they had these two children who seemed to be completely out of control. They were talking. They were shrieking. They were playing. They were running. All during the, the speaker, it was, it was, needless to say, very distracting. And as I sat there, it was everything that I could do not to get up and parent those little children. Have you ever been in a situation like that? Yeah, it was all I could do. But then I had to think to myself, I don't know what their background is. I don't know what may have caused. I, I looked at the children. It's entirely possible that the children maybe had some sort of, maybe some mental things. I don't know. Just the way they look. I don't know. But at that moment, I had to look and say, you know what, rather than choosing to make a judgment that these parents are just clueless, I'm going to choose to make a judgment that I don't know what drove them to this. And rather than being judgmental toward them, that's what I'm going to do. I had to do it. And so maybe for you, when it comes to your parents, maybe it's looking and saying, or the authorities, we don't know what brought the person to be the person that they are today. 
Have compassion, the Bible says. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgiving one another. The last one is this. Be willing to forgive. Now for some of you, it's just simply taking the step. For others of you, what they've done, pretty bad. But here's what the Bible is pretty clear on oftentimes. With God, all things are possible. Just a reminder of what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is not forgetting about what they did. It's not, it's not doing that. Forgiveness is not having warm fuzzies about what they did. It's not having that. Forgiveness is simply foregoing your right to retaliate. If you had a parent or an authority or somebody do something pretty significant towards you, your first thinking is, I want to retaliate. I want to get even. I want to get back at it. Forgiveness says, I'm going to not do that. I'm going to forego my right to retaliate and surrender that to God. That's a way that you can honor your father and your mother. You can honor an authority. You can honor a brother or sister in Christ, even when you believe in some cases they are, what I would say, dishonorable. Giving honor to whom it is due is not optional. And so this today, on a day when we celebrate having honor, giving honor, realize that giving honor takes Courage. Remember what Brian said? Standing firm. This is courage. Standing firm or continuing on in the face of difficulty or danger. Today, who do you have that you can give the gift of honor to? And so we've talked about honor and what honor is and how to give it to others, even maybe to those who don't deserve it. But I want to switch gears and I want to turn it back over to Brian because I want us to talk about now, what can we do to aspire to be people, not just to whom people have to give us honor because we occupy a role, but people who are truly deserving of honor. So Brian, come back. All right, so when we think about honor, when we think about not just giving honor, but what it looks like to earn honor, what we have to tell you is gonna be completely surprising because you've never seen this word in many weeks. Just kidding, right? Earning honor is a challenge. Obviously, we've talked about challenges uh, for many times in the past. But earning honor is a challenge. When you think about earning honor, what does that really look like? You know, is honor something just for a few chosen few? Is it like, like, is it just the section? Is this like the only section that's the chosen few that can earn honor? And the rest of you guys, well, sorry, you're hoes, you can't earn honor. Is that what honor looks like? I don't know. But what the Bible says um, may surprise you about it. So turn over with me, if you would, to Philippians 2. Philippians 2, 25 to 30 is where we're going to take a look. And we're going to answer this question of, is honor for everybody? So the, the scene here, the Philippians is written by the Apostle Paul. He's writing back to the church in Philippi while he's in prison. So he's in prison. He's saying, hey, I have, I have some real needs. I legitimately need help. And the, the church there, just like us, you know, if we hear, hey, we need help, what would we do? We would help, right? So the same thing, the, the church there helped. And the, the guy that they chose to help was a man named Epaphroditus. So let's read about him. So again, Philippians 2, verse 25. But I think it necessary to send back to Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but also on me, to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him, so that when you see him again, you may be glad, and I may have less anxiety. Welcome him in the Lord with great joy. And you're ready. Here's our word. And honor men like him. Because he almost died for the work of Christ, risking his life to make up for the help you could not give. So that phrase, honor men like him. So the good news here is that so the, the Bible clearly states there is that we can earn honor. And not only that, but it's not just for this one guy, Epaphroditus. He says, honor men like him. So it's for multiple people. So now we've expanded the pool from one guy, Epaphroditus, out to at least multiple people. So the question is, what makes Epaphroditus special? What did he do that was so amazing, so crazy, that Paul would say, honor men like him? 
Are you ready for it? Because here's the visual I have for you. Right? You want to know what's so special that Epaphroditus did? He was their delivery guy. That's it. He was like their Jimmy John's driver, right? I mean, you see all the commercials on TV. He was the guy that when someone had a need, he answered the call and he delivered it. That's all Epaphroditus did. So I'm not saying that to demean him by saying, well, he was just the delivery guy. Because Paul does use some pretty good words about him. He calls him his brother, his fellow worker, his fellow soldier. But what I'm trying to say is that what Epaphroditus did, it wasn't especially really special. I mean, it's something that everybody probably here could do. We can all deliver supplies to somebody. Right? It seems like that's something that all of us, any of us, could set out and do. So what Epaphroditus did, you know, he, he wasn't called a man to be honored because he was someone great, because he was someone spectacular, right? He didn't write a book of the Bible. He wasn't an apostle. He obviously couldn't heal people since he almost died of an illness. And this is actually the only time in the Bible where he's talked about. So he's not like this big superhero guy. He's just an ordinary guy who set out on a mission to help other people. And so when we talk about honor, when we talk about earning honor, what I want you to hear is that honor is something for all of us. It's an opportunity for all of us to earn. We all, men and women, can we be men and women like that? Men and women who earn honor, because honor can be earned by anybody. So maybe you're asking, okay, so if he was just an ordinary guy, if he was just the delivery guy, what did he do that was, that prompted Paul, what did he do that was just so, such a thing that prompted Paul to really esteem him? To say, hey, let's let's honor him. So let's take take another look at this verse with me. Right? He says, Welcome, we're looking at verse 29. Welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor men like him. Why? What does it say? Because he almost died for the work of Christ, risking his life to make up for the help he could not give. So what did he do? He valued the needs of others. In that way, really what we're saying is he honored Paul. He said, Paul, your needs are important. I'm going to go out and help. He said to the church in Philippi, I know you need to get these supplies there. I deem that to be important. I'm going to honor you, the church in Philippi, and I'm going to go out, and I'm going to deliver this stuff as your representative. And so he's saying, what he was really saying, he says, I'm going to honor you with the actions that I take. I'm going to honor you. Not just that. He's not just... He didn't just do a little bit, right? What I really think made Epaphroditus is a man of honor was the depth and the level that he was willing to go to personally engage to meet the needs of others. Let me say it again. It's the depth and the level that he was willing to go to personally engage in the needs of others. And so maybe you're sitting here today and you're going, well, I don't have a mission like that. So I'd really encourage you, if that's maybe what you're thinking, not to overthink it. Right? If you're married, God has given you a very specific mission. If you have kids or you're a grandparent, God has given you a very specific mission. Maybe he's given you a burden for, to help the people in Byron community, right? Through Byron Community Ministries. Maybe he's given you a coworker or a neighbor that you can see some very specific needs that you can help them with. So I urge you, don't overthink this. This isn't like, hey, I have to go through something huge, right? Remember, Epaphroditus... He was the delivery guy. He saw a need, and he engaged personally to that need. And that led to him being deemed to be a man of honor. And so I think that's something that each of us can do. Each of us can find a mission. Each of us can unpack what is the mission that God's calling us to. What are needs that we can tangibly reach out and help touch? But I do want you to know is what didn't he do, right? He, it doesn't say here that Epaphroditus took this mission and he set out to be honorable, right? It doesn't say he talked about, he's like, well, I'm going to be honorable by doing this. You're going to honor me for this, right? No, that's not what he did at all. And that's similar to the, what it says in Proverbs 21, 21, which I'm just going to read to you. He says, it says there, it says, he who pursues righteousness and love finds life, prosperity, and honor. Did you hear that? He who pursues righteousness and love finds these other things, including honor. And that's what I see with Epaphroditus. He didn't set out to be honored, but the things that he pursued, the things that he pursued by talking to the needs of others is what led to that honor. And so now here comes the hard part, right? 
So maybe looking and spotting those needs is easy, but when we really think about what Epaphroditus did, that's the challenging part, which is why we say that earning honor is challenging. So what did Epaphroditus have to do? What are some of the challenges that he faced? Well, for him to go to Paul was really inconvenient, right? Because he was in Philippi, and Paul was all the way over in Rome, a long distance, which meant that he had to leave what he was doing, he probably had to take, quit his job or take a leave of absence. He had to leave behind his church. He had to leave behind all these things. He had to drop what he was doing, and he had to go serve somewhere else. And I think a lot of times in our lives, we face a similar challenge. Because a lot of times when we're meeting the needs of others, it's not convenient, is it? It's not a convenient when you have someone say, hey, can you help with this? And you're like, I'm in the middle of, right? I'm sure you've been there. But it's not convenient but that's what it looks like to be people who earn honor, is to do inconvenient things. The other thing that Epaphroditus had to encounter was his lack of comfort. It had been uncomfortable. So I'm sure you've, you've gone on, on trips before, right? You've sat in the car for hours and hours and hours. And then as you've got older, you get out, you know, something like this, you're like, and you can just, you can feel the toil that simply hours of travel takes on you, right? Can you imagine traveling for weeks? For weeks, day after day after day. You know, I, I can imagine Epaphroditus' journal looks something like this. You know, June 1st, walk 20 miles. June 2nd, walked another 20 miles. June 3rd, walked another 20 miles, right? I mean, it's like day after day after day after day. He's traveling, so he's walking, and then he's probably taking a ship. Were the seas rough? Were they easy? I don't know, maybe it went from like, hey, walking 20 days, miles a day to puking over the side of the ship again. Day 46, puking over the side of the ship again, right? I mean, we don't know, but we know that it was uncomfortable to travel that far. And so in the same way, when we're talking about earning honor, when we have to do uncomfortable things, that should be a clue for us that when that's hard to do, that that's exactly what we're supposed to be doing, to be earning honor, to meet the needs of others. And then the last thing that I really see in the pattern that I said to deal with was just challenges. Think about the logistics of taking supplies over a thousand miles to another place, right? This was a day and a time when there wasn't like FedEx Air, right? It wasn't like, he wasn't the delivery guy, he just got in his car and whipped down there, right? I mean, he had to figure out, okay, how do I tangibly take these supplies? How do I keep them with me? How do I keep from getting stolen? How do I get, you know, figure out the path to go? How do I figure out the ship to sail on? How do I find Paul when I get to Rome? So there's an obstacle after obstacle after obstacle that he had to overcome in order to actually meet Paul's needs. And so when we think about earning honor, I think those are really the three ch challenges that we face. We have to be willing to deal with things being inconvenient. We have to be willing to deal with them being uncomfortable. And we have to be willing to deal with them also being filled with lots of obstacles. Sounds like fun, right? Sounds like great fun. But that's the, the point is that earning honor is a challenge, and that's why it's exactly a challenge, because it's not easy. If it was easy, it wouldn't require courage, and it wouldn't be a challenge. So I can tell you that real life honor, real life honor takes courage. And as we, we wrap up today, whether, whether we think about what Pastor John spoke about, about giving honor, or whether we talk about earning honor, what we hope you've heard is that real life honor takes courage. Real life honor, earning honor, giving honor, it's a challenge, but it's who we're called to be as followers of Jesus Christ. You know, this isn't an option. This isn't something that, hey, yeah, maybe just a, a few people do. This is something that we are each called to as followers of Jesus Christ, is to give honor and to live lives worthy of honor. So as we think about this, uh, some homework for you. So this is what we want you to do today, right? It's Father's Day. It's a day, a great day to be able to give honor. Pastor John described some ways we can do that. So what is one thing you can do today? Today, what is one thing you can do today to give honor to somebody else? And maybe it's as simple as making a phone call. Maybe it's as simple as telling a story about your dad. 
that would encourage you know, those, maybe your friends or maybe your family. But what is one thing that you can do today? Think about that and implement it. And then we also want you to think about what is one thing you can do this week, right? This week to live a life that where you're earning honor. Now that's a hard one. Because that's going to probably take some introspection. It's going to take some things that you have to figure out maybe. But we want to challenge you. This is real life stuff. Right? Real life stuff. So real life stuff we want you to do here. And that's why we're talking about real life courage last week, real life honor this week. But this is an opportunity to live this out in our real lives, to be people who earn honor by the way we live. To be people who care enough about the needs of others that we personally and deeply engage down into them. So guys, here's what I want you to do. Real life honor, it takes courage. It takes gut, it takes grit, it takes grace, it takes love, but most of all, it takes courage. It's, and yet, it's a real life option for each of us. So I want to urge us to not overcomplicate this, not to overthink this, but to be people of real life honor. So let me pray for us as the, as the band comes. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity that you've given us to learn about honor, to grow in honor, to be people of honor. We ask, Lord, that you would point out to us the places maybe where we need to give honor and the places where we need to earn honor, Lord. We pray that you open up our hearts to really be a people who walk closely with you. That on today, on Father's Day, that we would be a people who actively engage in real life honor, Lord. We pray that you'd show us what that looks like for each of us individually. We pray that you would help us to be people who just encounter our everyday tasks and be guys and gals like Epaphroditus who are willing to be the delivery guys, willing to be the messengers, willing to be the conduits through which you work into the lives of others. So show us how, Lord. Show us how to be these people, we pray. And show us how to be your people in real life, honor. in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Why don't you stand, please? As we sing, as we think about honor this morning, let's sing one more song, giving honor to our God and thanking Him.
Uh-huh. It's about midnight in the morning. <laughs> so let me just say a word over to Paul as we close out the morning. May we be blessed to know our good God, to live in His guidance as our perfect Heavenly Father. May we be people who honor those around us, people who honor our parents, honor the authorities, honor the president, even when at times these things are hard to do and these people are not completely worthy of our honor. May we recognize that you honored us when we were not worthy. And may we honor others in return. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Have a great week.